please continue to stand by. The call will begin momentarily. Your lines will be placed on a listen-only mode, and the call is recorded. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment, please. <laughs> hey there. I think we're ready to go whenever, uh, whenever you are. Elon? You are live at this time. Hello, good evening, and thank you for your patience tonight. I'm not the press secretary, Jackie McGinnis, and we are just two days away from our next opportunity to launch the Artemis One flight test to the moon. Artemis One launch is currently scheduled for Wednesday, November 16th at 1.04 a.m. It's a two-hour launch window, and we currently have a 90% chance for favorable weather. The mission management team met today to review the status of the mission. And joining us here at Kennedy to provide you all with an update is Jim Free, Associate Administrator of the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, Artemis Mission Manager Mike Serafin, Artemis Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Chief Flight Director Emily Nelson, and U.S. Space Launch Delta 45 Weather Officer Mel- Melody Levin. If you have questions, please press star 1 to enter the queue. But first, I'll give each of our participants an opportunity to provide an update. So, Jim, over to you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Thanks for hanging in there with us tonight. appreciate uh, your patience as uh, as the team worked through the uh, the MMT. There's been a a lot of work to get here, as we've talked about, as uh, some of which I just shared on Friday. And uh, the, the team here at KSC, uh, and really the engineering team for all the vehicles continue to work uh, to press towards Wednesday's launch, um, continuing to work things uh, post-hurricane, continue to work the normal prep stuff, and you'll hear about that. And as as I talked about on Friday, and we've continued to talk about, you know, there is more risk as we on this uncrewed flight test as we really stress our systems uh, around the moon and uh, to learn as much as we can about the vehicle and, and the MMT, today and and prep for that mission, uh, work through uh, some of the outstanding items, even going back and cataloging some things that we found in our other launch attempts, and uh, and, but we're still pressing towards a launch attempt on Wednesday, and and I'll let the others um, talk about the details of uh, what what stands between us and and Wednesday. Um, I do get the the pleasure of, I guess, announcing publicly that uh, we received confirmation that Capstone, Capstone arrived in the um, near rectilinear, rectilinear halo orbit, and uh, that is a huge, uh, huge step for the agency. Uh, it just completed its first insertion burn uh, just a few minutes ago, and over the next few days, it'll continue to refine uh, its orbit and uh, and be the first CubeSat to fly and operate at the moon. Um, you know, this is a very important orbit for us uh, here on the Artemis program, specifically because that's where we will fly Gateway. And as uh, as Capstone flies in that orbit for about six months, we'll get more data to understand and characterize that orbit. And in addition, Capstone fl- uh, carries a uh, navigational uh, tech demo that will help uh, other spacecraft operating around the moon. So, you know, as we press to Wednesday, uh, we already have our first uh, uh, first effort going on at, at the moon in Capstone and uh, press towards our challenging journey that we have and this difficult mission that we uh, continue to prepare for um, carefully and patiently um, because we want to take as much risk out of the system as we can, um, but there is risk in there and we need to be prepared for that. So for me, it's great to watch uh, the entire group of people um, across the government, across industry, across international partners really adapt and problem solve uh, over the past uh, several months. And my faith in their judgment and the decisions that we've made as a management team is is really unwavering. So with that, Jackie, I'll turn it back to you. Mike, over to you. Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you for continuing to follow um, our uh, preparations for the Artemis One mission. 
Uh, today we conducted our launch minus two day uh, readiness review with the mission management team. That was essentially a Delta launch readiness review uh, since our last, last launch campaign. Um, it was a uh, fairly lengthy meeting. It was about a four hour long meeting. And uh, during that we reactivated the mission management team and we reset our baseline headed into this uh, launch campaign um, and, and targeting a November 16th attempt. Uh, we reviewed our launch windows and, and just overall readiness of the operations teams, our, our facilities, uh, the, uh, the rocket and the spacecraft, um, just all the, all the um, changes that we've had since, again, the, uh, the last launch campaign. We reviewed some uh, issues, uh, some of which have been uh, retired uh, several weeks ago, but uh, some are relatively new as a result of the um, of, uh, Nicole and the storm that, that blew through here earlier in the week. Uh, we reviewed our vehicle configuration um, uh, from, from the top of the rocket, or the top, top of the spacecraft all the way to the bottom of the rocket, including things like the flight termination system, the batteries that we've reset, the payloads that we've reset. Um, all the uh, mission management team members polled go, uh, headed into the November 16th launch attempt pending uh, one open action and uh, two open issues. Uh, the two issues that, that got the, uh, the most discussion uh, pertain to storm damage or suspected storm damage as it, as it uh, relates to Nicole. And uh, the first was on the uh, liquid hydrogen tail service mast umbilical. We have a suspect electrical connector on the tail service mast umbilical that carries some um, information that is used to confirm a, uh, a subset of the launch commit criteria on day of launch. Uh, we do have redundant signals that are used uh, to confirm those launch commit criteria, uh, but the team is trying to restore us back to a, a, a normal baseline through some work tonight out at the launch pad. Uh, the other open item and, and the, uh, the action that pertained to the meeting today um, that came out of, out of today's meeting and is, is going to um, cause us to get back together for a launch minus one day review um, has to do with some um, room temperature vulcanization or RTV uh, material that has delaminated uh, from the um, uh, eastern side of the Orion spacecraft um, where the, um, the launch abort systems uh, aerodynamic shell called the OJIVE meets up with the crew module adapter and this this um, RTV material delaminated during the storm, and uh, we need to um, just spend a little more time to uh, review our flight rationale uh, headed into this launch attempt, uh, specifically as it pertains to uh, liberation of any um, remaining uh, RTV and debris transport. So we're going to get back together tomorrow as part of that. Uh, as a reminder, our mission priorities for, for Artemis 1 Priority one is to uh, re-enter the vehicle at lunar re-entry conditions. We need the rocket to do its job and deliver us to the point of translunar injection before the spacecraft takes all that uh, kinetic and potential energy out in the, in the form of aerodynamic drag and heat during the, during the um, direct re-entry from the moon. That's priority one. Priority two is to operate the vehicle in the, in the, uh, in the flight environment. That's all the way from liftoff through the point of translunar injection out into the deep space environment as we fly out through the uh, Earth's Van Allen radiation belts, out through the micrometeorite and orbital debris field, and then re-entry um, back into the Earth's atmosphere and splash down. Uh, priority number three is to retrieve the spacecraft for programmatic cost savings, uh, to retrieve the data on board, and then um, just to, uh, to have the, uh, the uh, vehicle for uh, engineering tests post-flight. And then priority four is what I like to call bonus objectives, things like payload um, objectives, and then um, to share the mission with each and every one of you uh, from liftoff out towards the moon and then back uh, to Earth reentry and splash down. So as we went through the mission management team meeting today, we uh, reviewed the changes from our technical baseline established um, our risk baseline established at the agency flight readiness review in the context of those mission priorities, discussed the likelihood of our success as well as any um, delta risk uh, to our prior baseline, and that is, that is the role of the mission management team. Um, so uh, I feel good headed into this attempt uh, on the 16th, and we're going to get together tomorrow to review some of our flight rationale as it pertains to that one open item on some uh, Orion RTV. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Jackie. Thanks, Mike.
And now we have Charlie Blackwell Thompson. Well, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here uh, to talk about our preparations for launch coming up here in just a couple of days. Um, let's see, these past few days, our team has been uh, working hard to finish up the inspections that uh, followed Hurricane Nicole. As most folks are aware, we had a rideout team that was in the launch control uh, center throughout the duration of the storm and uh, kept a close eye on the Artemis rocket. Um, we had imagery data, we had wind data, uh, and we had additional instrumentation um, that was on the SRB hold down bolts as well as the vehicle stabilizer. And so we had all of that information along with uh, the ground system uh, data that the team was monitoring during the storm. Uh, once we were cleared back into the center on Thursday evening, uh, the rideout team was released and uh, we began doing an eyes on assessment of the flight vehicle as well as the ground systems. Uh, we noted um, we had several things of note um, that we have worked our way through and, uh, and some that Mike just mentioned today that came to the mission management team. Uh, since getting back into the pad, in addition to the vehicle assessments and, uh, and working through the items uh, as noted, we've also began our preparations for launch. We had about 24 hours of launch countdown preps that remained. We had worked a number of our preparations for launch prior to securing for the storm, and we picked up with those upon reentry. On Friday, we performed a confidence test of the vehicle. We powered up all of the vehicle elements and uh, we found that all the vehicle data was uh, nominal. Um, as Mike said, we did receive, um, during the course of the storm, we had a measurement that we noticed, uh, it was a ground measurement, that we saw a little bit of um, what we thought was noise on that particular measurement um, during the, the course of the storm, and we did some additional troubleshooting on it afterwards. Uh, and uh, that measurement was actually on a primary or secondary main pump um, RTD and or a, a heater essentially that comes through the LH2 TSMU um, the tail service mast. It, um, it's a, what we call um, J8. It's a connector there. It's on the bottom of the plate. And um, we noticed that there were a couple of measurements that exhibited some of the same phenomena. Uh, so the team has been troubleshooting that over the course of um, the last day or so, and we replaced a ground cable. Uh, we did see some improvement uh, in the measurements, and all of them came within our LCC, our launch commit criteria band. Uh, but we still noticed that they were a little bit different than what we expected. So uh, tonight out at the pad, we are preparing to replace what we call the feed-through connector, which is the connector on the back of the plate. Um, and we'll go do that this evening, and, uh, and then we'll do a retest, and we expect that, that uh, this will remedy the problem, but uh, if not, then we'll certainly um, follow the data as we always do. So let's see, um, that is the only issue from a ground systems um, perspective that we're really tracking. We are on schedule to do our launch countdown uh, call to stations tomorrow, but it's actually you know, just a few hours away at 0124 this evening. And we're excited for that, and our countdown clock will begin counting at 0204. Um, since we were last together, there hasn't been any significant changes to our launch countdown, other than you may recall um, when we had launch countdown uh, attempt number two. Following that, uh, we went through and looked at our LH2 loading, and uh, we did change that just, just a little bit. Um, so that we would start that loading earlier and we would do it in what we refer to as a, as a kinder, gentler uh, method where we utilize the storage area uh, sphere, the pressure there to, to um, gently increase it to load the vehicle. So when you reduce the pressure and the flow rates, it takes a little bit longer to get that big tank full and we incorporated that into our loading timelines. We demonstrated that during our cryo demonstration, our tanking test, and that all went, um, went very well. So we've incorporated that into our timelines, and um, we are scheduled, I will give you the times here, our, um, our tanking time, our go for tanking is at uh, 1524, uh, and then we will start our LO2 chill down around 1544 on Tuesday, so in the afternoon, and then the LH2 chill down starts right around that same time. 
about 1544. Sometimes folks are interested in when we're going to do that LH2 uh, engine bleed kickstart because we know that um, previously that was uh, where we had seen some leaks when we put some pressure into the system and that'll be at 1727 local time. I will say that when we went through that process as part of our tanking event, um, it all worked uh, very well. So after our tanking, uh, we will do our 90 minutes of range safety checks. We will count down the T-minus 10-minute hold. We will do our final polls uh, to resume the count, and then we'll get into terminal count and, uh, and then count down toward an 0104 Eastern Time launch. Thanks, Charlie. Now we'll hand it over to Emily Nelson. Good evening. Um, all the teams in Houston are, are looking forward to the launch this week. Uh, that first day of the mission promises to be a, a very exciting day. Uh, shortly after liftoff, the MCC team in Houston is going to take over from Charlie's team here in, at Launch Control. Uh, for a launch on the 16th, that mission is going to last about 26 days. Uh, that very first day has an awful lot of activities on it. We'll have the booster separate from the core stage just a few seconds after launch, and then within about 10 minutes, the core stage itself will have finished and it'll separate. Then at about the hour and a half mark, the uh, interim cryogenic propulsion stage, we call ICPS, will fire the translunar injection burn, we call TLI, and, and then separate from Orion shortly thereafter. Um, at that point, we'll begin a number of checkouts of um, the Orion, including the Orion engines. We'll do a short burn to make sure that Orion is burning correctly. Um, and then uh, several Days later, we will begin the series of burns to achieve the distant retrograde orbit around the moon. Along the way, we'll do a number of checkouts of the various Orion systems, calibrating sensors, capturing some fairly unique imagery, et cetera. Um, once we get to the moon, we'll stay in orbit about a week, and then we'll begin a series of burns that'll swing us past the moon again on our return to Earth. As Jim noted, this is a, a test flight. We anticipate learning a great deal as we take the spacecraft as this first spacecraft designed for humans farther from Earth than any of our previous human-rated spacecrafts have been. We're prepared for any number of types of failures. We have predefined alternate missions to accomplish as many test objectives as we're able to in all cases. Our ultimate goal is to test SLS and Orion to ensure that we're ready for crew members on our next flight. Um, I'm sure we're going to find some surprises along the way, and our teams are ready for what promises to be an exciting mission. Thank you very much. And now over to you, Melody. All right. Good evening, everyone. Well, I have great news to give everyone. The weather looks really good for launch, so that's something I haven't really been able to talk about in quite some time, so I'm happy to share a happy forecast with everyone. Uh, today, we did have a cold front move through. It is currently positioned south of the spaceport. Um, we did have some showers and thunderstorms roll through, uh, but right now, most of the showers are positioned south of the spaceport. We do have some breezy conditions currently and uh, dropping humidity behind that frontal boundary, so that will certainly make things comfortable. Uh, the wind will begin to veer onshore tomorrow, um, so we may have some coastal showers uh, just likely staying near or slightly offshore, so we'll be watching those. Uh, for tomorrow, but in general, the web weather should be favorable for any outdoor operations that the, the team needs to get done. On Tuesday, we will be in a prefrontal regime, but uh, generally speaking, the, fl the flow should become more offshore in nature during the time of taking and also during the launch window. That's very good news because it should keep those coastal showers far away from us and that threat low. Uh, so because of that, I have given a 10% probability of weather violation. That translates, of course, to a 90% chance of favorable weather during the launch window early Wednesday morning. Temperature should be near 70 degrees with winds out of the south-southwest pretty steady at 10 to 15 knots, up through 200 feet. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you all very much. And now we will open it up for questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, you can press star 1 to get into the queue. First up, we have Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. Hello. Um, for Jim and or Mike, um, how much Orion RTV is actually delaminated? I don't know if we're talking a couple inches or a couple feet or even more. And a bigger question, if I might, with each delay, whether it's fuel leaks or hurricanes, the stakes seem to get ever higher for this first Artemis flight. And I'm wondering if that's ratcheting up the stress level for everyone and 
How crucial is it for this first test flight to go well in your view? Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Marcia, this is Mike. Um, we did talk about the amount of uh, the RTV that came off of Orion at the um, at the base of the ogive and and the uh, top of the uh, crew module adapter, and um, it, it was a an area um, that was about 10 feet in in length and uh, was centered on what we call the the 270 degree location relative to the Orion structure. Um, but that was basically the windward side um, of where the storm uh, blew through. Uh, it is a very, very thin layer of RTV. It's about 0.2 inches or less. That It's like 0.2 to 0.1 inches in thickness. Um, and, uh, you know, that we, we know that it came off in pieces, um, and uh, there's just this one, this one zone. In terms of... Um, Stakes, um, you know, I'll let Jim add anything he wants here, but, you know, we're working through this methodically. Um, we understand what the, uh, the risk baseline is for this, for this uncrewed test flight, and, and we've shared from the get-go um, that, that we know that there is, um, there, there's a fair amount of risk with, with this particular um, initial flight test of the SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft in our in our it is a purposeful stress test to buy down risk as Emily indicated earlier for crewed flight. So we have a deliberate lean forward strategy to help buy that risk down. The vehicle needs to fly through the same flight regime and flight environment and, and same flight profile whether we launch this coming week or a month from now. Um, and, and we do keep in mind that we do have a, a host of other systems in play that have a uh, limited lifetime on those, but we do reassess those, and we did reassess those headed into, um, into this launch campaign, and, and we, we got an update on those. So um, I would just say that, you know, the, the stakes are, are, you know, what they were coming out of the agency FRR, and, and we continue to review those. Jim, if you have anything to add to that. I think uh, you actually hit on one of the things that I wrote down as I was thinking about the question. The stakes are the same. Um, it, it, somebody said to me last week, uh, you know, this, this uh, core stage is no stranger to named storms. They started when it was at Michoud. They went when it was at Stennis, and now it's continued here at Kennedy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I think... As the administrator said, after our first launch attempt, you know, we're going to go when we're ready. We're, we're learning the systems of this vehicle. We continue uh, to do that. Um, and I said on one of my earlier calls, or I think I, I actually press face-to-face, -face, um, you know, the, the, the individuals that work on this program are people, and, uh, but they're, they're professionals, and they understand that, that systems are going to take some time to learn. They, of course, would like to see it fly, so we learn about it, so we continue down the path to Artemis One. But ultimately, they're, they're professionals, and they'll, they'll do their jobs, and the stakes are the same, as Mike said. We need to do this, uh, accomplish our three objectives, get the vehicle back, being one of them, and move on to the next launch. Thank you very much. Next, we have a question from Kristen Fisher with CNN. Thank you all very much for doing this. Um, my question is, obviously, this press conference tonight was delayed quite a bit by uh, a little over 90 minutes. Wondering if you all could just give us uh, a bit more insight into what specifically caused that delay and what level of dissent there may have been within that meeting um, about some of the issues that this rocket still faces. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Kristen. This is Mike Seraph. And um, so is, is the chair of the mission management team meeting, you want to give folks um, time to um, speak their mind and uh, get all the information on the table and, um, you know, have, have um, whatever hard conversations are necessary. Um, in terms of the delay, um, I, would, I would attribute that mostly to two topics. One was the, um, the uh, suspect electrical connector on the tail service mast umbilical at, at the one particular uh, data port that, or the outlet that uh, Charlie referenced earlier, which is called the J8 location. 
Um, that is a relatively new issue. Um, you know, we just got um, the information that we had a problem on, uh, on Thursday of this week, uh, of this prior week, relative to that particular issue, and then uh, we had to wait to gain access to the, the center and the pad, um, and the team is still working their way through that one. So I would, I would classify that as an emerging issue both in terms of understanding root cause, but also in terms of understanding what the impact is to the mission. Um, we're farther ahead in terms of understanding what the impact is um, to our launch readiness, um, but we still uh, need to get access to that particular connector, and the team is working that tonight. So we talked through um, you know, the removal and replacement plan, the inspection plan, and, and what testing was required relative to the the uh, timeline to set up um, for the launch attempt on, on Wednesday. So uh, that was a lot of new information for the team to, to walk through and process and really and really work through um, because we didn't have the luxury of, of having um, our offline technical forums headed into uh, today or, or this evening. Um, the other topic was the Orion RTV topic and, and that one um, we talked through what we knew and what we didn't know, and we had a fairly lengthy conversation about we have more unknowns here than we have knowns, and we need to to methodically step through our our flight rationale and use a um, an approach um, to basically uh, capture uh, the unknowns relative to risk, and the risk in this case is the debris transport. Um, you know, the Orion spacecraft is further up the stack, and we need to understand what this particular material type, um, its, its um, density, and um, whether there's uh, additional uh, material that could be uh, liberated during the launch phase. So, again, that was storm-related. We just knew about this on uh, Thursday and Friday as, as we started getting information in from the, from the post-storm inspections. Um, Recall the storm uh, blew through just three short days ago, and, and we've had a lot of new information come through. The rest of the systems checked out. We did talk through those, um, all of the uh, all of the vehicle health and status checks, all of the uh, systems on the ground side um, or, or the spaceport, and here at the uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, largely checked out. There were there were a few minor things that the team recovered from, and we talked through those. But you know, when you put a storm in front of you or now behind you and you want to resynchronize a team so you understand your risk baseline, you've got to talk through those those issues that that are relatively new and emerging. But you also want to revisit changes since the last time you got together and we spent the time to do both of those things today. I anticipated that this would be a, a long meeting. I, I thought it would probably be about two and a half hours. And when uh, our lead public affairs officer, Catherine, asked for what my what my thought uh, process was on how long that meeting would be. That's what I that's what I told her. I underestimated how long it would take to get through this. So you can you can fault me for for uh, underestimating the amount of conversation this would have. Um, in terms of dissent, I would say there was no dissent. All the uh, MMT members polled go, um, but we do have some work to do. Um, there were various um, discussions on how we could most efficiently work through. Um, this Orion uh, RTV uh, loss issue, um, but for the most part, uh, you know, the, the team is is moving forward as is one unit. We just we just got some work to do. So I, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Mike. Next, we have a question from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thanks very much. Um, hey, Mike, just to continue along that line. Um, a couple of questions, they're all related, but it's more than one. But how much material are we talking about that could possibly get liberated? Is it repairable at the pad? And I realize this is an unpiloted flight, but how is this different from the, the shuttle program opting to continue flying, you know, when ramp foam came off and did it an SRB, you know, electronics assembly in late 2002? I mean, you know, when people start talking about transport mechanisms on some kind of insulation, it automatically, you know, gets antennas raised up. Just curious how you view it in that context. Thank you. Yeah, Bill, um, as you're well aware, I, I work the shuttle program, and I, I understand the context you're providing. Um, 
how much how much RTV? Um, you know, this this RTV essentially um, uh, encircles the um, the base of the uh, O jive where it meets the crew module adapter. So it's it's the entire uh, circumference of the Orion spacecraft, and it's it's a thin band. I would say uh, I'm I'm estimating um, that it's a couple inches wide. It's very thin. It's uh, you know up to 0.2 inches thick, um, and it's the entire circumference of the spacecraft that we're talking about. Um, in terms of repair, we do not have access to repair this at the pad. It is it is way up the stack, um, and uh, and we we don't have access around the entire circumference out at the pad. Um, and then in terms of difference. With the shuttle program, um, it is it is a fundamentally different vehicle design. You know, the shuttle was a side-mounted uh, spacecraft on the side of the rocket. Um, now, the vehicle in this case is taller, and we do need to take that into account. Um, but in terms of uh, you know hitting uh, critical components uh, through debris that's liberated and then transported further down the stack. The physics are, are the same. The analysis is very similar, but where um, components and critical components are located are just fundamentally different. So we, we take that into account, and we look at all that through our, um, our risk analysis and risk assessment and then debris transport um, um, uh, process that we have. Thanks, Mike. Next, we have a question from Joey Roulette with Reuters. Thanks, Jackie, and thanks, guys, for doing this. Um, I guess this is for anyone who wants to answer. Uh, was the flight rationale uh, meeting that you guys have scheduled tomorrow uh, scheduled, I guess, specifically to discuss the delamination RTV issue, um, or was that part of the meeting that was going to happen anyway? Um, and also, do you think there's a chance tomorrow that you'd maybe want to go through the countdown as kind of like a rehearsal, even if you know you'll just scrub for the next opportunity, uh, just, I guess, to see if there's any other kind of issues. Uh, thanks. Yeah, um, Joey, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the second part of your question about the chance for tomorrow. Can you can you repeat that? Yeah, I guess, it's like, is there a chance you guys might want to just run through the countdown as some kind of, like, rehearsal if you maybe run into something that you know will preclude a launch opportunity for that day? Just, I guess, to keep, like, as a practice run or something, I guess. I don't know. Okay, uh, I'll take the first part of that question about the L minus one, and then Charlie, you want to take the second part about the the practice for tomorrow. So, um, yeah, tomorrow um, we would normally have as as a day of rest for the team. Um, there is this one very specific issue associated with the uh, the RTV on the Orion spacecraft that um, we recognize today that we needed more time uh, to review, and there are there is. Delta risk acceptance there, um, but the flight rationale, um, it just um, wasn't quite ready for disposition today at the mission management team. Again, it's a, it's a very new issue. Uh, it, it is something that we became aware of on um, Thursday and Friday of this week as, as we did the inspections of the vehicle out at the pad. And then, and then the, uh, the team started to identify that there is delta risk acceptance here and then started to work the, uh, the flight rationale. They flagged it, which is absolutely the right thing to do. And then uh, they, they brought it forward to us, um, acknowledging that there is um, additional risk here. Um, but in terms of the MMT saying that this is accepted and put behind us, we weren't ready to do that yet today with the information that was provided. So. Uh, we will take extra time to do that, and we will get together tomorrow to, uh, to ensure um, after the team has had a little bit more time to do that, um, that, that we understand the, uh, the Delta risk. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Charlie on the, on the practice question. Well, let's see. I would offer that we, um, we've had an opportunity during our tanking test uh, to go through and practice our loading and our loading conops, uh, timelines, and software. So I'm not sure that there would be a significant benefit from going through a loading operation. Certainly it would be, you know, our preference that as we work through this issue and if, um, and if we decide that we're in an acceptable configuration to go fly, that, that when we go tank that we would, uh, that that would be on our launch day. 
and, uh, and that we would preserve the maximum number of launch attempts within this launch period to try to get off the ground. Thank you both. Next we have a question from Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so on the RTV, um, what it, could it possibly hit if uh, there was additional delamination? And I guess I'm not really understanding what the purpose of that is. If the only issue, if it's not there, is that it become a debris issue. And then regarding the electrical connection on the TSMU, um, if replacing the feed-through connector uh, doesn't um, clean up the uh, the signal, is that a showstopper? Do both that and the backup systems need to be um, in uh, your kind of optimal configurations before you'd go ahead as a part of the launch commit cr criteria? Thanks. Yeah, Irene, uh, Mike Surf, and I'll take first crack at that, and then Charlie, you can add anything you want. Um, but in terms of what could the, um, the RTV on Orion um, hit, obviously the, the aerodynamic shell that we call the O-Jive um, is near the very top of the stack. So we need to look at anything that is, that is downstream as the vehicle accelerates up. And, and if debris is, is liberated um, or items are, are lost, uh, the RTV is lost as the vehicle accelerates through the Earth's atmosphere, it could get out into the airstream, and then the airstream will essentially slow it. It's like sticking your hand out of a car window as you're going down the highway. The air is going to grab it and slow it down, but the car is still accelerating down the highway. So um, we need to consider that phenomenon in this case. So anything that's downstream of Orion and, and the early flight phases up until we do booster jettison as well as um, the, the bulk of the atmospheric flight includes uh, the boosters themselves as well as the, uh, the interim cryo propulsion stage and the uh, and the launch vehicle stage adapter. We're really not worried about the launch vehicle state stage adapter. It is a very robust piece of hardware. The uh, interim cryo propulsion stage has a few uh, systems tunnels or uh, just aerodynamic protrusions where where some, um, some equipment is run up the side. And then the, uh, the boosters themselves, the uh, the nose cones and the attach points are areas that, that we we all need to look at. So th those are the things that we need to look at relative to um, the uh, RTV that, that could be liberated from, from the, the base of the OJIVE on Orion. In terms of the TSMU connector, um, I personally don't consider that a, a showstopper given the information that was presented. We do have some very well written launch commit criteria that uh, are very well thought out, and um, in the cases that we're talking about, the signals that come through require one of one of three signals to be go for launch, and, um, and and these signals are routed through different connectors. So it's only this one specific connector that has a signal, um, and even if the in, even if those uh, signals are out um, at that connector, uh, we would still meet our launch commit criteria. Um, again, given the uh, the pre-planning that that our engineers have done, and and right now there's no reason to deviate from any of those launch commit criteria. They're very well written, and um, they would support um, flying in spite of uh, you know what what this connector may bring. That said, we are we're hoping to get us back to a fully functional capability. So, Charlie, if you have anything to add to that? No, Mike. I think you covered it. Um, you know, we always like to have redundancy. But when we write our launch commit criteria, we write them for what is required to go fly. I would also uh, point out that these are utilized uh, for the thermal conditioning. Uh, in preparation for the auxiliary power unit start, so they're not used to fly the vehicle. It's not part of the onboard software. It is, it, they are in place for the APU start. Um, and as you said, we have redundancy. It goes through different connectors. and. Uh, would have a, a reduction, we would go in, uh, in the event that we are unable to get this corrected, we would go in with a loss of reduction. But it is per our existing launch commit criteria. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a question from Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Hi, thanks very much for doing this. Um, question from Mike, I think, uh, just to follow up on uh, what Irene said about the, the RTV, um, what is the purpose of this material? I understand it's probably difficult to work with, um, 
but you know, are you concerned about an installation or thermal problem if more of it peels off during launch, or or just sort of want to get some understanding of your confidence of, of why, you know, what you've seen there is not not a concern in terms of mission performance. And then just as sort of a broader question about this hurric this rocket sitting out in a hurricane and then launching a week later, that strikes me as really pretty impressive and, and speaks to the robust design of the vehicle. Is it, can you recall any time with the space shuttle that it sat out in a storm like this and then was able to launch in, in such a, a quick turnaround and, and by staying at the pad? Thanks very much. Yeah, Eric, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, the the purpose of the RTV material is um, it, it it well, first of all, it is a standard uh, aerospace material. Um, there are lots of applications on lots of spacecraft that use this particular material. Um, it is not difficult to work with at all, um, and it and it um, the in many cases it you could kind of think of it as a caulk to fill in a in a uh, in a space, and at the at the particular location, the particular application that we're talking about at the base of the ogive, where it meets the uh, the uh, crew module adapter, there is a little bit of a an indentation that goes around the circumference of the Orion uh, spacecraft. And the purpose of the RTV is literally to fill that in, because um, otherwise it, it creates a little um, aerial protuberance. In this case, it's, it's actually not sticking out in the airstream. It's actually an indentation away from the airstream where you could get a little circulation of, of air and um, in certain flight regimes create aero heating. That said, we do have a um, uh, protections in place um, as, it, as it pertains to um, the materials that underlie that RTB, this is just an additional layer on there to create a, a kind of a, a seamless airstream uh, flow as, as air comes over the ogive. Um, in terms of the turnaround uh, in the shuttle program, I, I know that we've had some short turns in the program, but um, nothing immediately comes to mind. And I'm, I'm looking at Charlie and he and I worked a, a fair number of missions together, and, and I don't know, Charlie, if you if you've got any that come to mind. I mean, I know we turned a couple of weeks between launches, but I can't remember anything that was storm related that we turned on the on the matter of days. Yeah, nothing comes to mind, but we could certainly uh, go back and look through the shuttle history and see if there was something there, and get back to you on that. But I don't know off the top of my head. Thank you. Next up, we have a question from Chris Gebhardt with NASA Space Flight. Uh, hi, yes, um, two for Charlie. Um, one, I'm wondering how many cutouts are there presently in the two-hour window on Wednesday morning, uh, and about how long are those? What's the longest one that you know of in there? And um, also, a, a question to the countdown itself. Um, when you get to the T-minus 33-second mark, I was reading today from some NASA documents that any cutoff of the count after 33 seconds is an automatic no questions asked scrub for the day, uh, regardless of what the reason is. So I'm just curious, wh why is 33 seconds a hold point, but 32.9 seconds an automatic scrub if you have an issue, even if it's not a technical issue? Thank you. Yep, so let's see, I'll start with the cutout question first. So um, we will get our final launch window cutout report um, on uh, on launch day. We'll get an update at L minus uh, two as well. Late. But the one that I have from a couple of days ago is um, we have about 56 cutouts as part of our, um, during our launch window. Most of them are just a few seconds long, um, but we do have a few that are a couple of minutes. And then let's see, why 33 seconds? So 33 seconds is the point at which the ground launch sequencer hands over to the, um, to the ALS, which is the onboard flight software. And uh, if the onboard flight software detects any out of limits conditions, then it will cut off and go into a safing mode automatically. And that's just the way the flight software was, uh, was built. Thanks, Charlie. Next, we have a question from Andrea Leinfelder with the Houston Chronicle. Hi. Um, I was hoping that, um, Mike, you could just explain the open action, the open issues in a bit more layman's terms. Our audience is not quite as technical. And also, I'm sorry, this is a question for me. What's the difference between an open action and an open issue? Thank you. 
Yeah, hi, Andrea. Um, and action is we've asked the team to um, do something very specific. And, and in this case, you know, again, the, the role of the mission management team is is a risk acceptance body and, and, a, and a risk management uh, forum. Um, open issue or open work is something that, that we just need to go we need to go do. Uh, we believe that there's a path forward. Uh, it is not yet resolved, and we and we need the team to uh, to go off and work that. So I, I hope that answers your question. Next up, we have a question from Emery Kelly with Florida Today. Hey, folks. Uh, good evening. Um, just real quick, are there uh, any possible theories about what may have caused the uh, RTV issue? Could it be the direction of wind from the hurricane uh, as a possibility? And uh, just real quick, uh, second part, if this were Artemis II, if there were astronauts on board, would this RTV issue be a showstopper? Thanks. Um, yeah, again, uh, Mike Serafin here to, uh, to answer your question. So the RTV was lost due to uh, wind and potential rain from the, um, from the um, Hurricane Nicole. It is on the windward side of the vehicle, um, and, and it faces the, uh, the, the easterly direction that the winds were coming from relative to uh, the storm and landfall. Um, and then relative to, again, Artemis II, if this were a crewed flight, we would be having the same conversation relative to our readiness to fly, crew on the, very, on, on, on the next mission. Do we understand the risk, and is the risk acceptable given all the, all the, all the variables in play? Um, it, it, but if, as I've noted earlier, um, there's a whole host of things that are um, – Presumed in that question, and and flying crew on Artemis II presumes that that we had an outcome on our uncrewed test flight that um, meets just our overall ability to uh, fly with confidence that we can safely fly crew the moon and back on the next mission. So, so it, it presumes that we're successful on this uncrewed flight test, and we've got to get through this test flight first, and we are going to learn things from it. Um, and, and we are going to adjust our approach and, and potentially uh, need to adjust um, some operations or systems relative to flying crew on the next mission, which is why we have this purposeful uh, build-up approach and this purple, purposeful uh, flight test strategy where Artemis I is, is uncrewed, leading to a crewed flight, and then um, Artemis II um, crewed flight test leads to our goal of, of, uh, of um, putting the first woman and the first person of color on the surface of the moon. So, uh, you know, it, it's not an easy question to answer relative to uh, would we accept this risk on Artemis II. We haven't even accepted it on Artemis I because we're still working our way through the flight rationale, but we would have some very similar uh, conversations relative to uh, flight readiness. Thanks, Mike. Next up, we have a question from Nicole Martiaro with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Hi there. Yeah, Nicole Martiaro from the CBC. Uh, Mike, you pointed out that Nicole, no relation, uh, was three short days ago. So is there any concern that, you know, God forbid there is an anomaly with a launch that it would be difficult to ascertain if it was due to hurricane damage and, for example, the RTV issue or some sort of issue with the rocket itself? I mean, why launch now rather than under better conditions? Well, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, it, it, that is that is something that um, we've spent considerable time in data analysis reviewing. Um, Charlie and, and her launch operations team have uh, gone through a, a series of systems checks, vehicle um, engineering test and, and data reviews, um, as well as image reviews and, and uh, walk downs of the launch pad. And all of that data and that information tells us that with these 
with these two exceptions that we've noted, this, this the faulty connector on the tail service mast umbilical, and with the, um, the RTB on the Orion spacecraft that's, that's delaminated, um, all, all the other systems check out. So we've put, put a lot of work um, over the last couple of days, and we've got great tools, and we've got um, uh, engineers and operators that are trained to go through this information uh, very quickly. In fact, they're trained to go through it in a in a launch countdown, in a terminal launch countdown, as well as in Houston uh, while we're actively flying the vehicle. Um, I used to be one of those people where where you you have uh, trained uh, scan patterns and you know exactly what data to look for to tell um, yourself as well as your your operations leader whether or not um, you've you've got an issue that requires um, action or to stand down on a launch attempt or, or um, a, a flight operation. So all the data right now is indicating we have a healthy rocket, a healthy spacecraft out there with, with minus these two issues, and, and we're, we're off work in those. And I don't know, Emily, if you have anything to add to that one. No, well said. Okay. And Charlie, anything to add to that one? Okay. Nothing additional. Well, then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, next is up is Micah Maidenberg with the Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Not sure who this would go to. Um, just real quick, is there any update on the root cause of the relatively large hydrogen leak in the second attempt? What caused that? Thanks. Uh, yeah, Micah, uh, Mike Seraphin again. Um, you know, we. We did go through the uh, the fault tree for the um, um, the hydrogen leak. Um, we could not definitively say what the uh, root cause was, but we did isolate it to um, less than a handful of, of potential causes for an object debris um, and and a couple of other causes on that on that uh, fault tree. And we've put. Um, a series of mitigations in place. Uh, thermal shock was another one, um, and then uh, potential for moisture uh, were all on the fault tree that um, that that we that we looked through. We took all the actions that we could to mitigate it. We replaced the uh, the seals. We tested the seals under a um, a, um, a a cryo demonstration. And uh, we modified the loading operations to reduce the pressures, uh, as well as to slow the thermal shock through this Keimler and gentler loading operation. We automated as much of the operation as we as we could, and then we went off and trained it uh, to ensure that we were ready for the operation. So uh, sometimes you just don't get to a singular root cause, and and this this is one of those cases. Uh, we that said, we did as much as we could, and um, and we're comfortable with the. Um, the posture headed into this next campaign. Thanks, Mike. Next up, Clayton Sandow with Newsy. Hi, guys. Thanks for doing this. Um, if the consensus is that you cannot launch until this delamination-related repair is made, I assume that means rolling back to the VAB where you can actually get access to it. And I was hoping you might give us an idea of just how complicated a repair this might be uh, and how it might affect the the timeline uh, going forward for, for other launch attempts. And, and also, Mike, you mentioned uh, other systems uh, in play uh, as having a limited lifetime. And, and does this cause a problem for you there? Thanks. Yeah, Clayton, you know, I, I think that's like we're, we're, we're focused right now on, on getting to this launch attempt. Obviously, we have a lot of data from when the RTV went on. Uh, you have to put it on. You have to let it cure. Um, so that, that takes time. Um, uh, a lot of that work was done uh, in the launch board processing f facility. A lot was done in the VAB. I think we have a lot of understanding of, of the process, but it does take time. But I, I think we're way too early to, to have conjecture on what would happen if we rolled back, how long would it take. You know, I, I, if the team comes back, their action for tomorrow is to assess the impact of the RTV as it is today and if we were to launch. Um, if, if the decision is to do something different, then we'll address the forward plan. But m what I really want them to be focused on right now is, uh, is, is heading towards that meeting tomorrow 
and the rest of Charlie's team focused on processing the vehicle for launch. Thanks, Jim. Next, we have a question from David Denault with About Space Today. Thank you. My, part of my question's already been answered, but um, no one's talked about the weather. And in weather in Florida, it can always be different. So how about a weather report, please? All right. Well, you must have missed my first uh, weather report, but basically the weather looks excellent for launch. This is actually the best forecast I've been able to produce for the team since we've uh, been trying to attempt to launch. So 10% uh, probability of weather violation, which is a 90% chance of favorable weather. Temperature near 70 degrees. Winds out of the south-southwest at 10 to 15 knots. And David, I was I was just joking with Melody that that is an imperfect weather forecast right there, meaning that we're 10 percent no go. So I just thought I'd add that on at the end. Thank you both very much. We're coming up on time, so we have time for one more question. Uh, we'll hand it back over to Irene Klotz from Aviation Week to close this out. Thanks. If uh, it turns out that you need need more time to develop the flight rationale, is the um, are there other dates before the 19th that might be um, discussed with the range, or would it go from the 16th through the 2 to the 19th directly for launch attempts? Let's see, Mike. I'll take a shot at that one. Um, as a launch director, anytime we don't make a launch or we need additional time to go assess things, we'll always go look at what that uh, next possible, earliest possible opportunity would be. Currently, we are on the range schedule for the 16th with our backup date of the 19th, but um, we, you know, our turnaround plans require about two days between launch attempts. So certainly, we would go explore all possibilities to look at what uh, was in the art of the possible for additional launch attempts, either by moving a day or looking at opportunities in between where we are currently scheduled. Yeah, and, and Irene, the only hard constraints we're tracking here are kind of in the, in the near term are that we have um, eclipse violations on the 20th and the 21st of November. Um, the rest of the dates are, are you know, within the art of the possible. Um, we'll see where we end up on this particular issue. Thank you both to our participants tonight and for you all for joining us. That's all we have time for. But tomorrow we'll be back. We'll have another briefing to give you the latest on the status of the launch countdown live on NASA TV. And until then, go SLS, go Orion, and go Artemis 1. Thank you and good night. This does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.